Hey film fans, this is Movie Talk with Aaron Hunter, and I'm Aaron Hunter, and this is the final episode in my series on punk cinema. I thought this series would be kind of a late summer, early autumn project, and it ended up going a little longer than that. Not because it's so full of rich insight into punk cinema, but because life happens, as I've talked about in previous videos. But thanks to all of you who've watched the videos, who've stuck with me throughout the series, who've made comments, and who've shared the videos with your friends, people who are into punk, and so on. It means a lot. Please make sure you like and share this video, share it with your punk friends, share it with your film friends, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. Throughout the series, one of the things that I have alluded to that's come up in many of the films, but that I haven't really touched on directly, is the way that for so many punks, punk individuals, punk bands, punk movements, they, or it, or whatever it is you're describing, burns incredibly brightly, incredibly intensely, but also incredibly quickly. Punk history is sort of riddled with examples of individuals, bands, and scenes that burn bright and then disappear. Uh, sometimes they fade away. Sometimes we don't hear much about them, but they're there. Think about, for example, Pat Smear, a member of the Germs. He's been around forever. He was in the, the late years of Nirvana, and he's been a mainstay in the Foo Fighters. We don't really think about him as Pat Smear the Punk, unless you're a hardcore Germs fan. Um, there are examples of people and, and bands that stick around for a long time. John Lydon is a good example. After the Sex Pistols, he went in, on to form Public Image Limited, a profoundly influential post-punk band. And after that, well, <laughs> maybe the less said the better. I read recently that he's considering entering as a uh, Irish contestant in this year's Eurovision Song Contest. So we'll see if we have John Lydon to talk about this spring. Um, but for so many others, it's really a one year, two year, three years and done. The Sex Pistols are a great example. The Germs and Darby Crash. And like with Darby Crash, a lot of this kind of one and done is um, ends in tragedy. Sid Vicious is probably the, the great example of that. Um, but for a lot of punkers, that flash is a short moment in their lives that extend long beyond the punk scene. And how does punk affect them? How does it affect their lives going forward? Do they remain punk? Do they eschew that sort of the intensity of their, their punk aesthetic and their punk ideology? Um, do they try to escape it but can't? All of these questions come up around former punkers who, who live longer lives, um, and even former punkers who live long but still truncated lives. And that's the case with this week's film, the 2021 documentary, Polystyrene, I Am a Cliché, which I'll be considering in this episode of What Makes This Film Great. I Am A Cliché is a 2021 documentary, as I said, that was co-written and co-directed by Celeste Bell, Polystyrene's daughter, who was born in 1981. And that's a very important part of the film, which I'll come back to in just a few minutes. Her co-writer and co-director was a guy named Paul Snig, S-N-G, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Zoe Howe also contributed to the writing. The cinematography is by Nick Ward, and it was edited by Zana Ward Dixon. It has music by Tim Boland. It features a cast, I guess you could say, of Celeste Bell. Ruth Nega does the voiceover of Polystyrene's diaries, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well in, in just a moment. And then it features a host of contributions from punkers from the 70s, uh, rock music journalists, people who knew Polly in her life. Um, and, and a variety of other people as well. And it features these people because the film is an attempt to understand who polystyrene was, 
But it's not just a typical talking head, this is a woman in her journey documentary. It is, but not only. Um, and that's because the film has made some very interesting kind of formal and stylistic choices in the way it decides to tell Polly's story, to depict her life, and to incorporate the voices. And it really is the voices of these people who knew her, who worked with her, who played with her, um, who were in love with her. And it, it, this is part of what makes it a really fascinating and I think moving story because it's not just telling the story of Polly's life. It's telling the story of Celeste's efforts to understand her mother's life. And that's really what it is. It's so interesting to me that they chose to call the film I Am A Cliché because part of what the film is about is Celeste's efforts to, to get to know her mother beyond the historicizing of punk, beyond what a lot of the documentaries I've talked about do that kind of, oh, this was a great era and she was a great person. She was so important and that's it. To be fair, there is a lot of that in this documentary and Celeste is interested in airing that story, but she's also interested in puncturing that story and trying to get to something deeper and I think more personal about Polly which is what makes this film stand out from any of the other documentaries that I've talked about in this series. First, just quickly, uh, for those of you who might not know, and the film goes into this in a lot more detail, Polystyrene was born Marion Elliott, or Marion Elliott Said, you'll see both surnames used, um, in 1957. Her mother was a white British woman, and her father was a Somali who had immigrated to the UK. And the father is in and out of her life. The film doesn't go into a lot of details about where he ended up, only to let us know that he kind of... Uh, they had a few children together. She has some siblings who take part in the film, um, but he mostly wasn't around. But she grew up in the 60s and 70s of England as a, a biracial girl at a time when there weren't a lot of biracial kids in England. And this becomes an important part of the film's early section because it talks a lot about how difficult it was for her to live with that biracial identity. As she says at one point in the film, The black kids there, they can all say, we're black, we can all stick together, we don't like white people, I could never go out with a pork head. But if you're half cast and you're with them, you don't really feel that because like, your mum might be white and they're slagging off white people. And if you go over the white kids, you have to reject your father. And I think this is typical, or if not typical, at least common in the lives of biracial people who often struggle with feeling like they're neither in this community nor that community, and therefore not part of either community. So then where do they belong? And the idea in the film is that struggle that she grew up with informed a lot of the decisions she made about the music she would sing, the poetry and lyrics that she would write, the fashion that she inspired, uh, and, and so on. And, and the film is quite good on that. There's some really great footage of sort of poverty-stricken council estates in England in the 60s when, when Polly was growing up. And it, it has a lot of people from black British backgrounds talking about um, their similar struggles if they were coming up around the same time as Polly, or for younger people, um, what an inspiration she was. And, and so this becomes an important part of establishing who she is. And who she is, is the singer of the band X-Ray Specs. And X-Ray Specs is one of the foundational 
punk bands of the British scene. So often talked about are the Sex Pistols, of course, I spent a whole <laughs> uh, episode of this series talking about them, uh, the Clash, the Buzzcocks, but X-Ray Specs were huge. They were on all the British uh, music shows, Top of the Pops, etc. They had a very successful run in New York, which I'll come back to. They inspired uh, fashion, they inspired new musicians. I mean, Nina Cherry comes in here and talks about how important polystyrene was to her and understanding her own biracial identity and, and channeling that into her music career. She's, she, as a force, She's, she, her fire burned really bright to go back to the, the metaphor I used at the beginning. And she was incredible. Her voice is amazing. I mean, just listen. <laughs> So this is who the film is about, and it's very much about Polystyrene's life. And, and although her name is Marion and her sister refers to her throughout as Marion, everyone else calls her Polly or Polystyrene. So that's what I'll continue to do throughout this video. Um, she continued to use that name at least professionally throughout her life, um, and, and so I'll, I'll use it here as well. And. It, it, it's hard to imagine, just like it's hard to imagine the explosion of the Sex Pistols, it's hard to imagine how important she was, how uh, future thinking she was, how fashion driven she was, and how influential all those things were, not just to biracial women in the UK, although to them, but to the whole punk scene. She had a punk aesthetic that was not the sex shop aesthetic. It wasn't the, the bondage aesthetic. It wasn't the biker leather aesthetic. It wasn't the safety pin aesthetic. It was something completely of her own devising. And it was just as influential on punk and, and also I would say on new wave going forward. I mean, you can see in her outfits from the late seventies, the, the color, the sort of plasticity, which I'll come back to, the, the awkward nature of how they fit that directly shows up throughout the 80s in new wave fashion, new wave aesthetics. And, and that's coming from polystyrene more than any other punkers that I can imagine or think about. If you know any others, let me know in the comments. In 1980, Polly met Adrian Bell, uh, a British man, and they had a kind of a whirlwind romance, fell in love, got married, Polly got pregnant, and in 1981, her daughter Celeste was born. And Celeste, as I've said, is one of the co-writers and directors and narrators, one of the co-narrators of the film. And a lot of what the film is about is Celeste's efforts to, to get to know her mother better. And part of the reason for that, as the film goes into in quite a bit of detail, is that they had a, <laughs> a difficult relationship. Polly was an artist, she was a singer, but she also struggled with mental health throughout her life. And early in Celeste, Celeste's life, Polly's mental health condition was misdiagnosed, which led to some kind of tragic behavior and some hospitalization and institutionalization, which fractured their relationship. Uh, and Celeste was raised for much of her life by her grandmother, Polly's mother. Um, and they did reunite eventually, and their relationship got a lot stronger, at least according to the film before Polly died in 2011 of cancer, which was really tragic. I mean, cancer's always tragic. It's a son of a bitch. But she had just recorded a new album and seemed to be making a comeback. She was making live appearances. Um, in the 2000s, she had put X-Ray Specs back together for some one-off shows. There was, you know, discussion like, are they gonna put out a new album? Um, and and then she got cancer and passed away. And for Celeste, that was kind of doubly tragic because not only had she lost her mother, but she, they seemed to be forging a new adult, healthier bond. 
that Celeste was excited to pursue and then it was taken away from her before she could really kind of go and revisit those years of her youth that she had grown up thinking were negative or bad or irresponsible or whatever it might be. And so the film becomes in a lot of ways her effort to understand those years of her youth. And so in order to do so, she has to understand who her mother was leading up to those years. And this is what makes it very different from, well, any of the other films I've looked at in this series, because it is about punk and it is about Polly's uh, participation in the British punk scene and the New York punk scene. It is about, you know, Polly's anti-establishment attitudes, her anti-consumerism, her, her very kind of divergent and, and forward thinking, I would say, um, understanding of capitalism and the reification of human experience, if I can use a term like that. Um, that's very much there. But it's also about how the woman who developed that thinking through her engagement with punk music became Celeste's mother and the fallout of their relationship because of who Polly was. So it's a, it's a mother-daughter story. It's a punk rock story. It's a story about mental health. It's also a story about hope and possibility, but also squandered possibility. And so it makes for a quite a heady mix. And it also makes for quite an emotional story that still, despite all of that, is grounded in some really like rip roaring, awesome, tear your face off punk music. One of the stylistic decisions that the, the filmmakers have made is that none of the talking heads are <laughs> our heads. So there is a lot of participation from, you know, as I said, uh, musicians, the music press, former punkers from the scene, Polly's family, Polly's life. And they tell really interesting stories. Like um, Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth tells a story about seeing X-Ray Specs at CBGB's back when they came to New York City. How when Polly was singing Oh Bondage Up Yours, when she would get to the Up Yours part, she'd stick the mic in Thurston Moore's face and he would sing it and how, you know, he's a young teen and this just kind of blew his mind, you know? That's a great story. But it's all done in voiceover. All of the participants tell their stories in voiceover. So we do not see anyone's face except Celeste's. This is really interesting to me and it's counter to a lot of, you know, modern contemporary documentary. In fact, one of my criticisms of a band called Death in the last video, which is a great film, is that it falls into that sort of talking head style of Netflix documentary where it's just a lot of footage of people talking to the camera, which is fine to get the story, but sort of cinematically it was a little boring and actually a little cliche. Whereas this film, you're always looking at almost constantly images of Polly. Um, if not Polly herself or the band X-Ray Specs, there's a lot of footage of the places she lived, you know, the, the clubs she played in, other punk bands of the time. So we do, do, we do see others. I don't want to say that we don't, but that's all in archival footage. So there's a lot of the members of X-Ray Specs when the band's playing. We see archival footage of the Sex Pistols and so on. But contemporaneously or, you know, from today, it's all done in voiceover, except for Celeste. But then to kind of layer onto this, we see Celeste a lot. Um, and there's kind of two different stylistic presentations of her. One is just Celeste sitting in this kind of light grayish white room, which does look sort of contemporary modern docu-style, but she's never talking. So we just see kind of images of her face. The camera moves around her a little bit. We see expressions on her face. So they're not still shots, they're, they're, it's film. But as she's talking in those sequences, it's in voiceover. So she's not telling us her story to the camera. It's almost like she's listening to her own story 
or thinking about her own story. Sometimes I felt jealous of her music. Her songwriting robbed me of the attention I craved. And then we see her actively pursuing her mother's story. And again, this is split into two styles. One is her going through her mother's paraphernalia, old gig flyers, song lyrics, which are often presented on screen, um, magazine cutouts, all kinds of things from Polystyrene's life. And then we get these very interesting shots behind the back shots of Celeste as she goes to New York as she goes to the the estate of the Hare Krishnas where where they lived when Celeste was a young girl and those shots I at first when I was watching the film I thought they were a little bit cliche because it's like Celeste looking into the distance but the weight of them combined with the other imagery in the film actually started to get to me because I started to feel like and I might just be making this up because I really liked the film and I'm putting a positive spin on this, I don't know. But I started to feel like as Celeste can't truly see or touch her mother, she can only recollect her through this paraphernalia, through the words of others. We can't see her. We can't see her coming to this realization. And so this disjointed presentation of her voice, which we hear quite a bit, and her non-talking visage, or even back of her head, it, it makes the film a little bit uncomfortable, and not in a negative way, but in a realistic way that she's never maybe going to get the understanding that she wants, and neither are we. And so I really ended up loving the style of the film and it sets it apart. In a way, the film from the Fury tries to do something similar by keeping the, the Sex Pistols, the members of the Sex Pistols in the dark as they're giving their kind of talking head story. Um, and, and I appreciate the way that film does that. And, and here, this is something similar, but it's different because it, those in the dark uh, talking head shots from Filth and the Fury replicate talking head shots, but they, they kind of obscure them through the, the darkness of history or the fog, let's say, of history. Whereas in I'm Cliché with Celeste, it's more like, I don't want to say futility because there is a hope in this film, but the, the sort of, I don't know, her heartbreak, I think, is maybe what it's about. Or her coming to grips with and being okay with, but not necessarily being happy about her loss. Something like that. And it becomes, I think, very, it's subtle. It's not in your face, which is part of why it works, but, but very moving. And then the other thing that we get in the film is the voiceover uh, of Ruth Nega. And she is, if you don't know her from the film Loving, I first saw her actually in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is where my son loves her from. Um, but she's like lighting up the film world right now and the theater world. She did a, a performance of, of Hamlet here in Ireland last year that I didn't get to see, but apparently was amazing. And she does Polly's voice. And I'm, I wonder if her own biracial identity, so Ruth's um, mother is Irish and her father is Ethiopian. And I wonder if that was why they invited her to do it, because she could bring a kind of simpatico pathos to her rendering of, of Polly's um, mostly diary entries, but also some of her print interviews and, and things like that. Um, but again, we don't see, we never see Ruth on screen. We only hear her voice, which gives it a feel of you know, of Polly talking. We do hear Polly, we see her in archival footage, we see her in interviews, and their voices are not the same. And, and Ruth, she does have an accent that sounds English. So it sounds like she's trying to imbue um, Polly's dialogue with a, with a Britishness, an Englishness, but not mimicking Polly, if that makes sense, which, again, I think is a wise choice because it, it, it breathes life into it. It gives it a, a presence that works for the film. There's a lot of great footage in the film, as I've said, of X-Ray Specs performing and of Polly giving 
interviews from that period, the sort of late 70s and, and early 80s. And it's, it's excellent, and if you're into punk, you should check it out for that. But a couple things I'd like to talk about are the periods sort of right before that and, and right after that. As she's coming into late adolescence and adulthood, just about to sort of see the Sex Pistols like so many people did and decide that's what I want to do. And she's kind of figuring out who she is. She's grappling with this dual identity of being biracial. She's grappling with British racism in the 1970s. There's a lot in the film about the rise of the National Front and, you know, this kind of anti-immigrant immigrant sentiment that's still... I mean, it's plaguing Ireland right now if you want to look up Ballymun. Um, and, and, you know, it still plagues this world today. And, and we get some of that and what it was like to grow up in that sort of cauldron of racism. And we get a little bit of discussion, which I haven't talked about too much, about how that racism infiltrated uh, the punk scene, including in one great moment that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but we get some of her journal and some of her poetry, and it's a very raw and ragged, but also beautiful and thought-provoking um, poetry that she's writing, some of which would become lyrics for her music. And we, we often see the, the poem in her handwriting on screen, and we hear Ruth Negga's uh, recitation of it. And so we get, for example, one of my favorites, it's very short, where she talks about wanting to just to leave England and to, to rediscover her roots in Africa. I want to go back to Africa and find my heritage. I want to learn about the warrior and how my ancestor lived. Because all I've seen is Jungle Book. And I know that ain't the way it looks. I grew up on Tarzan too. What can you do? What can you do? I'm gonna cross Ethiopia and see that ancient land. And then I'll go to Somalia, barefoot across the sand. One of the things that drove her and that she talked a lot about in her life before, during, and after her time in X-Ray Specs is her sense that um, the world is fabricated and that the, this, the fakeness or the plasticness of the world is detrimental to human experience. And this affected her throughout her life, but more frequently or more intensely, I should say, at different times. And it also led into her choice of the name, polystyrene, which she talks about in one interview. The name, polystyrene, it was given to you by a publicist or what? No, I thought I'd use the name something around today, you know, something plastic and synthetic. And I just looked in the yellow pages and then I saw it. So I don't know, got it really? So that's how the name of Polystyrene finally was born, from the yellow pages of <laughs> their phone book? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounded all right, because I thought it was a send-out of being a pop star. It's like a little figure, not me, being Polystyrene. Just plastic, disposable. That's what pop star sort of meant to me, and so therefore I thought I might as well send it up. I think this also feeds into her reflections or recollections about uh, being a punker. You know, she's very clearly part of the punk scene. She played in clubs where, or X-Ray Specs played in clubs where, you know, the Buzzcocks and the Sex Pistols and the Clash and so many other bands played. But she also resisted that label because... I just consider myself as a person first and anything else what anybody else might call you well. They're just names, really, aren't they? Just given to trends and people and things like that. She found that even in the punk world, there was a, a plasticity or a phoniness that she had a hard time dealing with. This comes to a head or a major head when X-Ray Specs put out their first album. And for the album cover, the, the record label, which was EMI, which the Sex Pistols had so much trouble with, um, 
distorted her image. When the album came out, she was really annoyed because the record company had slimmed her image down on the front of the album cover and BPs as well. And she was really angry that somebody had manipulated her image. Why couldn't they just put me on as I was? Her image was often mocked during her time in the band. Um, she had braces that she wore on her teeth and she was not sort of thin and statuesque. Um, she wore colorful clothes. She wore plastic clothes, which she talks about the sort of irony or maybe even hypocrisy of. And so people were constantly poking at her image and yet she embraced that as part of her project. Like if you don't like the way I look, that's on you. So then when the record label changed the way she looked, it slimmed her down and de-accentuated her braces. This infuriated her. Even more than the kind of um, artificial construction of punk as a label, there's a very disturbing story that the film tells us but doesn't engage with too much. And that's one time when she's at a party in London, she had a fascination or some say a crush on John Lydon, Johnny Rotten. So she spent a lot of time hanging around at Lydon's house with the Sex Pistols and the other bands. And there's this, this, this really awful story about Sid Vicious locking her in a cupboard for hours at one of the parties. Now, I, I talked about Sid in, in previous videos and he was a, a problem child to be sure, but I think they, they don't spend a lot of time on this story, but you get to a moment like that and you can see how someone like Polly, a punker, but also an outsider, and everyone in punk's an outsider in a way, but she's a woman, she's biracial, she has her own vision of things, so she's in some ways marginalized within this group of the marginalized, and how she can see, like, you guys are full of shit, you know, and if you're gonna do that to me, maybe I don't wanna be a part of this. Eventually, when the band goes to New York City for a stint at CBGB's where they played regularly, uh, the overwhelming nature of what she saw as the fakeness of New York really got to her. Now, at this point, and, and she talks about this in some interviews, the band had been touring, constantly recording. Uh, she wasn't sleeping. You get uh, some of her friends and, and bandmates talking about how she just didn't sleep. And then when they got to New York, there were just a lot of drugs, I think. The, the film doesn't go into her drug use a lot, but I think, you know, she was part of the punk scene. She was using drugs and drinking, but it intensified in New York. And I think that she, she was just completely exhausted and on drugs and probably using drugs to combat the exhaustion and the combination of all of that and then being in New York City at the end of the 70s was overwhelming. And again, she saw it not so much as just overwhelming, but fake and plastic and false more than fake. I saw everything that I've been writing about in extreme, but for real. For them, it wasn't a joke. It was the way they lived. For me, it was all a joke play with it, indulge it, have fun with it, because there's not really that much of it over here. But when you go there, it's so bad that you think, God, if that's what it's going to be like, I don't want it. The weird thing about all the plastic is that people don't actually like it. But in order to cope with it, they develop a perverse kind of fondness for it, which is what I did. I said, oh, aren't they beautiful because they're so horrible? It's very perverse and I realize that. And that was what was so frightening about New York. I find all of this discussion really interesting because it'll remain throughout her life, um, although more subdued as she kind of is removed from the spotlight. But it, I mean, it's something that is with us today when you know we talk about microplastics in our diet and when we talk about you know the petroleum industry is destroying the world and destroying the climate she's not voicing this or articulating it like a scientist would it's just an instinct that she has and she puts that instinct into her music she took on the mantle of it in her name and she you know it's something that she I guess as any punker does, you could say she fought against that, that 
plasticity and that falseness. And I find any time this comes up in the film really interesting because a lot of what she's talking about as a young woman in 1970s Britain is kind of the discussion, the backbone of the discussion of many of the world's problems today. And she just had her finger on it, like acutely on the button. And it's also kind of what eventually drove her out of the punk scene. Her, dis her disdain for, for the plasticity of the world also led to or coincided with or informed, I don't really know, her first kind of mental break. And this is when she had returned to London from New York. The band was still going. Um, and she had this experience where she saw a UFO and the UFO in, in pink and green, bright colors, and it transmitted a message to her. She said at breakfast time the next day, oh, I saw a flying saucer outside. It's told me to give up the electric and plastic way of life, go for a simple life. And we said, what are you on about? Took no notice, got in the car, and in the car she started taking her clothes off saying, I want to go back. I want to be Marion. I want to go back. This was the beginning of a big shift. And I don't know if she saw a UFO. I mean, now you have the US government saying, yeah, we've been studying UFOs for 50 years. Maybe she saw a UFO. Um, maybe it did transmit this message. It's, a, it's not the worst message. But the people around her thought that she was losing it because she talked about this. And it led first to her doing something that I thought was really cool, which is the story about how she shaved her head. And this happens at a time when, of course, punk, and especially punk in England, is combating the skinheads who generally were representative of racist Aryans who, you know, were taking on the, the anger and the energy of punk, but funneling it into this sort of white nationalist way. And then Polly gets up on stage and, and shows the world her shaved head. And it's a great story. But it's also this that would leave her to quit the band. And she decided that she no longer wanted to be a punker. Part of that leaving this plastic world behind was leaving this punk world behind. And this happened at the height of X-Ray Specs popularity. They had one album out, they were on TV all the time. They're being asked to take part in these huge festivals. They're, they had a potential future and she leaves it all behind. Maybe she's burnt out. Maybe it was the message from the UFO. Maybe it was her mental health, some combination of all of those things. Um, and decides she wants to take a different route. And she puts out this album, Translucence, which was kind of savaged by the punk community. It didn't sell, and it ended up with her being dropped by EMI. Listen to it. It is not a punk album. I don't even know if I would call it post-punk, but it's a wonderful, beautiful album. And you, her voice shines on it. It's kind of quiet. The songs are poppy. There's a little bit of world music vibe. It's not kind of full world music like we would get later in the 80s. And um, it's fun. It feels fun, which connects it to X-Ray Specs in a lot of ways. So I had never heard it before until I watched the film. I'm like, I gotta listen to that. And I love it. It's really good. It's been on like constant rotation in my house for the last few days. So I would highly recommend it. But at the time, it was seen as a betrayal. And so at that point, she was like, I'm, I'm done with you. And I don't want to just sort of reiterate the whole story of the film, but you should check it out. She, she has a religious conversion. She gets into Hinduism and India and through that, the Hare Krishna movement. And, and she has her child at this time, Celeste, and attempts at first to raise her through, through Krishna, um, which, which ends up not working out. And uh, this leads to the breakdown in their relationship that I talked about earlier. And she spends much of the sort of late 80s and 90s in obscurity, in borderline poverty. There's a great scene where Celeste talks about walking down the street with her mother when she's a young girl and everyone recognizes her and Polly being like, I'm famous, but I'm poor. 
and dealing with that because she was a face of punk. She burned bright and she was so important to that movement that people remember her. They want to talk to her on the street, but they've actually got nothing for her, nor does anyone else. So she spends a kind of vagabondy life with other artists, with hangers-on, um, with people who can help take care of her while her daughter's being raised by her mother, by Celeste's grandmother. Um, and the second half of the film goes into that in quite a bit of detail, and it, it it's the part that turns this from a punk documentary into a, a really deep, touching, and, and kind of tragic um, family documentary. There's a great scene near the end of the film when Celeste is describing how her mother started to re-engage with the music industry. And it, it, it's an, another example, and there's a lot of these in the film, I haven't talked about most of them, but it's another example of how the film's style makes it, you know, this isn't an experimental documentary by any stretch, I don't want to give that impression. But it has fun with the form, and there's this lovely moment where Celeste is describing Polly getting back on stage and she's nervous and she's on antidepressant drugs. She's now been diagnosed properly as having a bipolar disorder. Um, and so she's nervous, but she's, she's taking her medication. And Celeste is walking through the corridor and onto the stage and we hear the performance. And it's another kind of disjointed presentation of sound and image that works really well, I think. And then finally, we get some footage of Celeste and her mother on stage at that gig singing Oh Bondage uh, together. And this is the reconciliation and the, the re-engagement with the music world that the, that's so heartbreaking. They ended up working on an album together called Generation Indigo, which I haven't listened to yet because I've been spending so much time with Translucent, but I will. It gets tons of really good reviews, and it came out in 2011. Um, the year that Polly died. And so you have this sense of almost promise. Celeste, Polly are re-engaging with each other. Polly's re-engaging with the world. Um, she'd been, you know, signing her name to, to protests about the music industry. She'd been popping up at different concerts. And now she records this album with her daughter's um, input. And then she gets her cancer diagnosis and passes away. And one of her last wishes was that her ashes would be scattered in India. And Celeste is really resistant to that because in her mind, it was her mother's trip to India and her embrace of Hinduism and via Hinduism, the Krishna lifestyle that eventually led to their break. And so for her, even though it's one of her mom's last wishes, it's a hurdle. And there's a nice scene at the end of the film where Celeste finally goes after 10 years, and this is kind of the cornerstone of the film's impetus in a lot of ways. And once she gets there and experiences India and tries to experience it through her mother's eyes, she has this kind of revelation and it's subdued. It's, she doesn't make a big deal out of it. Like, ooh, look at India. It's the magical place for me. It's just a sense that she understands her mom a little bit better. It's another piece of the puzzle. And so, like a lot of the film, it's understated and it's something that I can appreciate because a lot of times, you know, Western media will go to places like India or China or Japan and kind of exoticize them. And it's not something like that. It's more just like, this was a place that my mom loved and when she went there, it, it changed her and now I have a better understanding of how and why. And so I have a better understanding of her. And it, it contributes to the film's sense of both sort of wonder and hope, but also tragedy and sadness because 
it's, it's a part of her mother's life that she never really got to understand while her mother was still living. And she's just experiencing it now, sort of after the fact, which is the tragedy that tinges the whole film. Polystyrene, I Am a Cliché, is a great film, and it's an interesting film to end this series on because in a lot of ways, while it's about punk, and while it's one of the more sort of thoughtfully made films, I wouldn't say it's a punk film per se, but it uses its form in ways that I think are a little bit more thought-provoking than some of the other documentaries we've looked at. Um, but it's a reflective film. It's not kind of in your face like uh, the decline of Western civilization. Um, it's not even making an argument like a band called Death. It's more an exploration of a woman's life, an exploration of a mother's life. And it's almost like that mother happened to be one of the greatest punk singers in the first wave of punk music, maybe in history. Um, but it is more than that. It's not just that she happened to be that. It's how that role in her life, which was short, you know, it was four years, um, affected her relationship with her daughter and affected her life going forward, affected her mental health and so on. So it becomes, I think, more than any of the other films I've looked at in this series, an exploration and just one of many possible explorations of the post-punk life, the effect of punk on the individual. And in that way, I think it's honest and it's thoughtful in that getting caught up in that whirlwind was great for her, but it also may have damaged her or at least skewed her potential in a way. Um, and that makes the film really like just a, it's a, I think I'm going to teach it in one of my classes this semester. I ended up liking the way it uses voiceover so much and the way it, it's contrast of voice and image is really thoughtful and something I think students could get into. So I haven't completely decided and I have to soon because class starts in two weeks, but I think I might kind of squeeze it into one of my classes. Anyway, I highly recommend it. I wouldn't say it's a punk film. It's not going to fill you with the kind of energy of punk films, but it does, there is a simmering rage. There is a, a clear um, evaluation of racism and misogyny in England in the punk movement of the time. And so it has a lot of the elements, but it deploys them differently and it reflects on them differently, which makes it a really great film about punk on, on many levels. And for that, it's really worth watching and I highly recommend it. Thanks for tuning in everybody. And thanks to all of you who've kind of watched these videos, commented on the videos, shared them. I wasn't sure how this was gonna turn out, but I've really enjoyed this, doing this series. And as I said, I might use I'm a Cliche in a class. I really wanna to put together now, and it might take me a couple years to convince my department, <laughs> but I wanna do a, a uh, a class on punk cinema and kind of using this series as a springboard into what would that look like as a semester long kind of upper level module, but we'll see. Might never come to fruition. I'll keep you posted. Uh, in the meantime, please make sure you like and share this video, share it with your punk friends, share it with your film friends. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. I'm getting close to the big 2K, which for my channel is, is quite a landmark, so I'll be happy when I get there. Um, so hit that subscribe button and whatever you do until next time, please keep watching movies.